Today we're going to Persia. Persia, known for the rugs and their cats. If we were literally traveling to Persia, we'd be hopping a plane to what is present day Iran. Today we're gonna focus our attention on a fascinating Old Testament book that centers its activity on the royal family of Persia. There are, are two books in the Bible named after women. One is Ruth, the second is the one we will consider today. Let me walk you through this incredible story of Esther. Okay, and this is like a movie, but the characters can be a little confusing, so I'm gonna try to help you get through this. There's this Persian king by the name of Xerxes who loved having these huge parties. The word banquet appears 12 times in this, in this one book alone. The word only appears 24 more times in all the Old Testament. So at the start of the book of Esther, Xerxes holds an 180 day banquet for his court and for dignitaries across the empire. Then he throws a, a seven day party for all the inhabitants of the capital city. At the end of that seven day throwdown, he ordered his queen Vashti to make an appearance because she was so beautiful and he wanted to show her off. She wasn't about it. When she refused, he banished her from the court and started a new search for a new queen. Now, basically a beauty pageant is held, but this was a, this was a sick kind of beauty pageant. It was, it was sad, it was sordid, and basically he was trying to find a woman out of his harem to be his new queen. A young woman by the name of Esther is chosen to be his queen. Esther had been raised by a relative by the name of Mordecai, a Jewish leader in the city who at one point had discovered an assassination plot against the king, Xerxes. Now, Mordecai had gotten sideways with a high official of the king's court by the name of Haman. Now, Haman is really a lousy guy. And Mordecai had refused to bow down to this guy. And to get, to get even with Mordecai, Haman, the, the second highest ruler in the land, asked the king to execute every Jew in the land, and that would include Mordecai. And in his great appreciation of Haman, the king agreed to execute all the Jews. Haman was so excited, he went ahead and built a gallus for the execution. Here's the rub. Esther, his queen, unbeknownst to him, is a Jew. Remember, she's, she's related to Mordecai. Mordecai pleads with Esther to speak to the king and stop this mass execution. But the date had already been set. March 7th was fast approaching and the gallus was built. One night, Xerxes couldn't sleep, and he asked that the court records be read to him. Now, that would certainly put me to sleep. The court records reminded him that Mordecai had never received any recognition for exposing the assassination attempt that saved his life. Strangely enough, at that moment, Haman arrives to ask the king for permission to execute Mordecai for not bowing down to him. But before he could ask, Xerxes asked Haman a question. He said, how would you recognize a man that the king would like to honor? And Haman, thinking the king is talking about him, lays out this elaborate parade with the king's robe on the honoree riding the, the king's horse. To Haman's shock, Xerxes orders Haman to carry out that wonderful plan for Mordecai, which he does. Esther, meanwhile, invites King Xerxes, oh man, and Haman to a couple of banquets where she ultimately convinces Xerxes to spare the Jews and to execute Haman on the very gallows he built for Mordecai and to do it on the very day that he had set to execute the Jews. 
March 7th. To this day, Jews have a celebration on March 7th called the Feast of Purim to celebrate this event. My Jewish friends love this day and they, they say it perfectly expresses the unofficial summary of every Jewish holiday, which is this. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. <laughs> That's the story of Esther. Now, what do we learn about God from the book of Esther? Here's the first thing and probably the most important thing today. God runs things. God is sovereign. God is the chief, supreme, total, absolute authority. Here's a very interesting fact about the book of Esther. The book of Esther is 10 chapters long. It has 5,633 words. Guess how many times God is mentioned? Zero. Zero. You see, God is way bigger than his name. The events in Esther all took place through the mighty hand of God, and it never took the mention of his name, never took the work of some great church or some great preacher. As one of my mentors, Reverend W.C. Holmes, loved to say, God is God all by himself. And frankly, if this weren't so theologically wrong, you could say, man, God is the man in this deal. But God runs it. God runs it. I love how, how Paul gives God huge props in Romans 9. He says this, who in the world do you think you are to second guess God? Do you for one moment suppose any of us knows enough to call God into question? Clay doesn't talk back to the fingers that mold it by saying, why did you shape me like this? Isn't it obvious that a potter has a perfect right to shape one lump of clay into a vase for holding flowers and another into a pot for cooking beans. Xerxes was a very powerful man and he knew it. But let me tell you this, earthly leaders do not determine our destiny. They do not. This mighty king of Persia or the ruler of Assyria from last week or the, the Pharaoh in Egypt or the king of Babylon were all leaders of mighty empires in their day. And incidentally, all those empires ruled with a harsh and cruel hand over God's people. How'd that turn out, by the way? Not so great for them. Because God is sovereign. What he says goes. Here's a second thought. We cannot fully comprehend him. We cannot fully comprehend him. This, this story of Esther is complicated. God, God intersects it at every point. If Queen Vashti shows up at the banquet like King Xerxes commanded, there's no need to find a new queen. If Mordecai does not have favor with the king and, and is not related to Esther, there, there's no way Esther ascends to the throne. If Esther is never chosen as queen, then she never has the ear of the king and the massacre of the Jews happens. But God, but God, we cannot fully comprehend him, and that's very okay. He is way beyond our comprehension. There, there's a beautiful paradox that comes with knowing God. Look at this quote. God does not come to us in nicely defined, rationally explained thought categories. God does not fit himself into our theological textbooks. The Hebrew God breaks all the rules. He is near, yet transcendent, clothed in human form, yet holy. More terrifying than can be imagined, yet compassionate, invisible, yet revealed, judging, yet merciful, sovereign, yet humble. No matter where you look, God breaks the molds. Friends, we cannot put our God in a box. Prophet Isaiah says this in Isaiah 40, who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of this earth or has weighted, weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does, does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? 
To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asked the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name because of his great power and incomparable strength. Not a single one is missing. In regard to God, we cannot fully comprehend him. And what can we know about ourselves after we reflect upon this great God? Well, first is this. We cannot perfectly imitate him. We are made in his image, but we cannot perfectly imitate him. But don't let that keep you from trying. I, I, I'll never be all-knowing. But that should not complete, uh, keep me from applying the knowledge that I do have for the good of the kingdom of God. I will never be all powerful. But that should not keep me from applying any power I do have for the work of God. I will never be everywhere at the same time. But that should not keep me from representing God in whatever corner of the world he places me. I can strive to be just and loving and truthful. My sweet dad put on a coat and tie and went to work every morning for 60 years. I'll never forget as a kid my first coat and tie. I was so excited. Why? Because it felt so good? No. Because I looked so sharp in it? No. It was because I thought I might look like my dad. And there was nothing in the world I wanted more than to be like him. Did I imitate him perfectly? No but I tried. Are we going to imitate God perfectly? No. But we can look at God's attributes and his personality and we can try to be like him. Of course, our greatest opportunity to see what God might look like in our lives and what God might do is to look, look at Jesus. I mean, you know I'm a Jesus guy, right? I, I've got a good rabbi friend, which may be weird to you, uh, we, you, you, you'd think we might get all worked up about the whole Jesus thing. But that doesn't really happen. I love my rabbi. And he loves me. And he's funny about Jesus. He told me once that he loves Christmas. He said he loves Christmas because the whole world takes a moment to remember and revere a young Jewish boy. That makes him happy. <laughs> One summer, when my son Avery was in middle school, he went to a church camp and when he came back, he had on a, on a T-shirt that was given him at camp. And emblazoned across the front were these words in bold letters, get an attitude. I thought to myself, what kind of church camp <laughs> tells a middle school boy to get an attitude? I mean, seriously, that's all I need. And then I read the back of his shirt. Philippians 2, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Get an attitude, Jesus' attitude. We cannot fully comprehend him. We cannot perfectly imitate him, but we can forever know him. We can forever know him. Esther knew him, and we can too. James 4 it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Are you brave enough to believe that? That every movement toward God prompts his movement towards you? To me, one of the greatest truths on this planet is that we can know the one who created the planet. Look at this quote from M.P. Ferguson. She was an evangelist and a social worker in Los Angeles in the late 1800s. She says, our God is at home with the rolling spheres, the planets, and at home with broken hearts. And of course, access to God was radically altered on the cross. In the Old Testament, God was in a spot. He was in a place. He was in the tabernacle or the temple. And to be more specific, he was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. 
the, the chief priest, and only the chief priest entered that room, and only once a year on the Day of Atonement, a, a rope would be attached to the priest's foot so that if he died, he could be drugged from the room for nobody else was allowed in the presence of God. But with Jesus, we come to understand a whole new intimacy with God. John 15, 15 says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. It's a whole new paradigm. One, one parting encouragement for the day. Be alert to God's work around you. Be alert to God's work around you. Don't be so engrossed with things that fill up your day that you can't be aware of a God who will fill up your eternity. The most profound moment in the story of Esther comes when Mordecai is pleading with Esther to speak with the king, to ask him to rescind his edict, to murder all the Jews in the kingdom. And Mordecai says this to Esther in Esther 4.14. He says, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Who knows if perhaps you were made a mom for, such, for a time such as this. Perhaps you were assigned this difficult assignment at work for such a time as this. Perhaps you are facing health challenges for such a time as this. Wherever you are in your life today, God is there too. And let me tell you, he is not done with you. He is far from finished with you. Let's pray together. Father, this story of Esther is so rich with your power and your grace and your ability to take every incident in our lives and move it toward the big finish, whatever that might be. Father, I thank you that you meet us in common places, that you meet us in our homes, at our work. And for some of us, it's such a time as this that we can see you do your most mighty work. So I pray that we might be very alert to your work not for our glory, but for yours. Not so that we can say, look what we did, but we can say, look at our God and see what he is doing. Father, we love you, we need you, and we thank you that we can know you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at hopechurchmemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.